over the last couple of weeks, we have been working through why the human nature or the hu um, humans actually need a savior. The uh, what is really the the ultimate issue with the human race that requires us to have a savior and looking at the fact that the human race is lost. We're already condemned because of our own actions. Uh, we wrath abides upon us because we're children uh, being unsaved. That is, we're children of disobedience. And in looking at that concept of disobedience, it's ones who they, they don't want to. Well, actually, it's it's better to say that unpersuaded is really what that word disobedience in that context means. Uh, would they, and they don't want to be persuaded. The human race in general does not want to be persuaded. Um, the first chapter of John talks about the fact that they don't want to come to the light because the light exposes their deeds. We also talked about the fact that the human race is under the authority of darkness, that Satan is the father of those who are perishing, and looking at the heart and how the heart is full of uh, all kinds of bad things that defile a man. I remember the heart is the center of a person. That's where the uh, desires from the, from the flesh or the body, the, the physical desires, from the sin nature also, which resides in the flesh, the soul and the spirit all come together, and there is a determination on what a person is going to do. That would be the heart. We also, um, also when it comes to how a person interacts with God, Humans now, because of a, uh, well, because we've died in our spirit, that is, we're separated from God in our spirit, we tend to um, focus more on emotional things. And the problem with that is it puts it at a bit of a disadvantage because spiritual things aren't emotionally based. And you can see over in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 that a soulish man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're actually foolishness to him. Now, the things of God are not foolishness, but they're foolishness to somebody who comes at them from an emotional perspective. They don't make sense. They don't make you feel good. They don't please you in that, in, in that type of a sense. But actually, they are very logical and very proper. Right. So they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, this uh, concept of no, nor can he know them actually is, uh, doesn't have the inherent ability to know them, not from, a, not from a soulish perspective. And this is due, of course, to the separation of the spirit from God. And all unsaved people have this separation. The human race, being in the authority of darkness, also lies in the arms of the wicked one. And we see this over in 1 John. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19 talks about this. And you really need to pick up on what he's saying here. Uh, some of the translations try to make it a little bit more specific in the way it's referred to here. Like here I'm looking at the, uh, the New King James and it says, We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Is a way that they're translating this. Now, they're doing it in italics because they're implying, of course, that um, the under the sway of is not actually in the original. What they're trying to interpret properly for us is this word lying, to lay. It's a specific word that is used of an infant laying in its mother's arms and being swayed as far as comforting. It's a very specific type of a term for this. So what, what Satan is doing is he uses the world system to pacify the human nature and the sin nature along with that so that he can ultimately control it. That, of course, works against us for understanding things as they really are. The human race is full of unrighteousness. We see an example of this over in Romans chapter 1. Now, you're going to have to start out in verse... You're going to have to start out in verse 18. 
where it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from the heavens against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It's not really the wrath. It's not talking about the tribulation periods. It's a quality of God's wrath. And why, as you go through here, it's because man, in different time periods, mankind or humans, all humans that were alive at that point, knew God. They knew who he was. They had an experiential knowledge of him. Yet they chose to reject him. They chose instead to take the image of God or the proper opinion of God. It talks about glorify here in verse 21. And they chose to change it into the image of mankind, of corruptible mankind, more specific. Of birds, of four-footed animals, and of creeping things. So they, they, they went away from God and they chose that the actual proper knowledge of God, they determined that that wasn't something of value to them. Why? Because they couldn't do the things that they wanted to knowing full well that God would actually punish them. Now you get down to verse 29 in Romans chapter 1 and verse 29, it gives you a very specific list of unrighteousness. And this is talking about those who are rejecting God. They have an unapproved mind and they're filled with unrighteousness. Now some of our translations leave part of the, uh, and I don't know why they leave out part of the words here, because um, it's pretty strong that we should actually have in here unrighteousness. We should have fornication, which uh, here in the New King James they're calling sexual immorality, uh, wickedness, um, covetousness, maliciousness. And this whole list, of course, isn't just talking about actions. It's also talking about what's going on in the mind. Because it's a, it's a, remember, unrighteousness is the bigger term. We also see another example of this over in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 4. Over in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 4, here it says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor have they seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. And that's in verse four that I'm in, in the context. Now you drop down to verse six, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our unrighteousness like filthy rags. See, since the beginning of mankind, we have never seen anything or perceived anything that is like God, like the one God. We've made up God's, but they're just made up. That's all they are. You know, God has shown himself multiple times to the world. You know, and now, of course, he's giving an opportunity for reconciliation. And it is a time of faith. It's a time of taking God at his word. Um, well, what do I mean by that? I mean, because you've always had to take God at his word. I mean, today we live in a time period where you don't live by sight. You live by faith. You take God at his word. There's no less um, understanding of who God is. As a matter of fact, we have opportunities today to understand God even more than other um, people before us. That would be before the church. Okay. So um, the best that we have to offer here in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, is really the, the righteousness that we have is like filthy rags to God. It's of no value at all to God. And Ecclesiastes also actually references this. So we go over to Ecclesiastes and chapter 7 and verse 20. And it says, For there is not a just man on the earth who does good and does not sin. Not a single one. That's pretty, that's, that's saying a lot about humans, you know, where there is not a single person who does good. There are none righteous among us, and we see this over in Romans, and not a human by themselves. Romans chapter 3 talks about this. In Romans chapter 3 and starting in verse 10, 
Here it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understand. There are none who seek after God. They all have turned aside. They have become unprofitable. There are none that do kindness. That's not your word for good there. That's your word kindness. Not one. This is the condition of unsaved mankind. The human race is controlled and directed by the sin nature. You know, the sin nature, that part of us that really seeks to be independent from God and begin to um, Mark chapter 7 and verse 21 says, for from, for from within, out of the heart of man proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts. These are all the things that relate to the works of the flesh. As it's described here, these things come out of the heart of a man, the center of a person. And he drops down to, to even to 23. All these evil things come from within a man and defile him. And it's coming as the sin nature is actually ruling. And we also see over in John chapter 3 and verse 6 an example of this. John chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay, now in this context here is talking about the fact that the, that um, and in the greater context of, of the subject that we're talking about, that flesh is infected with the sin nature. And that flesh is ultimately going to produce the things of the flesh. Romans chapter 8 and verse uh, 7 talk about this. Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 also talk about the fact that because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Now that word carnal there is fleshly. It's a fleshly mind is actually hostile towards God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. It actually does not have the inherent ability to be subject to the law of God. It is going to make up its own laws and its own justifications. This is why today we have so many different religions. You know, especially religions within what they call Christianity because they don't want to follow God's rule. So they make up their own, because they're coming at it from the flesh. A lot of these actually, it's, it's quite, uh, it's sad and quite stunning to me how often I find groups of people who call themselves Christians, who not a single one of them can actually give you the gospel. You know, and I'm not talking about whether they're good people or bad people. Most of the time, they're pretty decent people. But they cannot give you the basics of the gospel. And then when you express it to them, they're extremely hostile towards you. Because that's showing that they're coming from that fleshly mind. The human race, of course, can then only ultimately manifest the works of the flesh. And we see those in Genesis chapter not Genesis, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse, starting in verse 19, going through 21. For the works of the flesh are evident in these. Now remember, these are works of the flesh. These are things that the flesh do. They do not in and of themselves mean sin. That's really important to, uh, don't misapply the term to this as you're looking at, because some of them are sin. Adultery, fornication, that's sin. There's no question about that. Licentiousness, well, that's a, a, a lifestyle without morals. There's going to be sin within that type of a lifestyle, different types of sins. Uh, it's not outbursts of anger, it's inner burning anger. Inner burning anger is not an action. It's internal, it's unrighteousness, and it's a work of the flesh. How is this a work of the flesh? These are the kinds of people who are angry about everything. It doesn't matter what it is. They're angry people. And it's because they're actually functioning totally from their flesh. The human race ultimately is awaiting destruction. Over in 2 Thessalonians, we actually see this. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, here he says, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction, 
or eternal destruction is probably a way uh, better translating that from the presence of the Lord and from the, the glory of his power or the glory of his strength would actually be the term. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was also believed. Now, of course, he's talking about those who are unbelievers. They are ultimately going to face an eternal destruction. The human race as a whole is an enemy with God. And you see this over and again in Romans chapter uh, Romans chapter eight and verse seven. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it's hostile towards God. A fleshly mind is hostile. And when we function from our flesh, that is the only way we can really interact with God at all, is in a hostile way. By the way, moving back over, this isn't, you know, a lot of times when we talk about this, it's like these are all bad things. But the reality is, uh, going back over to the works of the flesh, there are works of the flesh that can do things that look good. Okay. Uh, one of them, this word sorcery that we translate is, this word sorcery is actually a pharmakia. Uh, it's a word that really, um, our, our concept of a pharmacist comes from that. A pharmacist is somebody who uses drugs or handles drugs. Now, in our case, they're dispensing them. In this case, as this original meaning was more somebody who uses uh, either chemicals or drugs or environment or something like that to make people feel as though they are closer to God or that by being around that particular person, they're closer to God or God listens to that person. So if that person took your request before God, God would listen to them before he would listen to you. Um, we translate this probably better as religious superstitious awe. And I think it is actually a better way of putting that because it is a, um, the intent of it is to come in a way as if you're religious to serve, but the serving isn't the, the one and true God. The serving goes to, well, it just talks about this right before that idolatry and other things that are involved with that. Um, and I, and I have no doubt, and actually this has been a thing for humans for many years, the use of drugs to try to be closer to uh, God. You know, um, a lot of uh, hallucinogens and other stuff like that to make themselves feel as though they're closer to whatever God they're, they're praying to or feel like their God is actually real because sticks and stones aren't actually real gods. So, you know, there's more involved with this. But today we see that, to, you know, in, in where people want to be closer to God and they build environments and they build up things to make it look like they're closer to God. Uh, people will wear a cross on their neck, you know, claiming to be a Christian while they're doing the most uh, heinous and disrespectful things that a human being can do. Yeah. Heinous and disrespectful. Um, cursing, loving the world system, uh, fornication, adultery, involved in these kinds of actions, and they're going to hang a cross on their neck as if that suddenly makes them righteous. Religion and superstition is what that is. I can do all these things because of the cross on me. I was thinking about the cross the other day. You know, it's interesting how you never see a mention of the cross in the uh, New Testament in a way where somebody's hanging it around their, their uh, neck and, and being proud of it. After the resurrection, did the apostles go and make little crosses and hang them on their necks? They didn't. What did they do? If you want a symbol, the best symbol we have is a fish. It's not a cross. The cross didn't save us. What saved us? It was a resurrection that saved us. You know, yes, the cross work was necessary, but in the end, that resurrection is what saved us, and God is not hanging on a cross. Now, when it comes to salvation, well, actually, in looking at the, before I jump over to that, 
and looking at all the different things in relation to the human nature. The fact that we rejected God's law, this would be back with Moses. And again, you can't claim that you've done better because if you've sinned in your life at all, you have done the same thing that Adam did. You know, only the, there is a slight difference because unlike Adam, you actually have the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't. So really, you have less of an excuse if you want to say it that way. But Adam didn't really have an excuse. He chose. He knew what he was doing. And he chose it. You know, we've all sinned. We've all chosen to go away from God. And the end result of that is destruction. And it's not that God wants everybody to go to hell. It's just God, the type of being that he is, he is not going to tolerate unrighteousness in his presence. It is going to be judged. So the human race is lost because of what they've done. But God has actually stepped in and he is, and he has offering salvation. But salvation is not the entirety of God's plan. I kind of want to look at that a little bit. Uh, it's part of God's plan, but it's not the whole thing. There's other things involved in what God is actually doing. There's a few examples of how you get hints of this in, in some areas. And then, of course, um, some are not so much hints. They're more like sledgehammers, as he's being very clear on what he's referring to. So over in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9, we get kind of an example of this. We're in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9, and it says, And he said, Go and tell the people, hearing, uh, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Why? Why would they hear and not understand if it was about salvation only? Why would they see but yet not perceive? Remember, Christ began to speak in parables because the Jews rejected him as the king. He didn't start out speaking in parables. He started out actually not really speaking much at all, did he? I mean, he presented the fact that the kingdom of, of the heavens is present, and then he showed it by healing everybody, by casting out demons, things that could not have been done before, by raising the dead. But they still rejected him. So he began to speak in ways that they couldn't understand, which is, of course, is showing you that there's something going on more than just salvation. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, we also get an example of the fact that Christ, the, the term Christ, um, the person Christ, or the, would actually be the reference to the Messiah, is called elect. He's called chosen. Now, if you understand who the Messiah is, he didn't need salvation. He's God in the flesh. He didn't sin. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God. Your word chosen there is your word elect. It's the same word. Drop down to verse 6, it says, Therefore it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Again, that's that chosen. But this isn't chosen to salvation. This is not an election to salvation. This is an election to a position, which would be the Messiah. Unsaved humans that worship the beast are going to be specifically dealt with in a different way than others are. And this is over in Revelation. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. In Revelations 14, 9, it says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any worship the beast in his image and receive his mark on their forehead or on their hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his, uh, this word indignation is uh, a word I do believe that means his wrath. Let me find 
Yes. So when it talks about here, which is poured out in full strength in the cup of his uh, wrath, it, this indignation term is actually talking about the outward manifestation of God's anger. The first term here in verse 10 is actually anger. So this is the way it would actually uh, properly translate. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the anger of God, which is poured out full strength in the cup of his wrath. And the wrath is that outward manifestation of God's anger. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will ascend uh, from the ages into the ages. Your word forever there is ages into the ages. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever received the mark of his name. This is actually an interesting passage in understanding, and I know it's a little bit off the topic, but this shows you that the mark of the beast is not something you can get accidentally. It's on purpose. You are choosing to serve the beast. And in choosing to serve him, you are going to take that mark. And I say that because there's so many people, even today, you know, they want to say that COVID is uh, somehow the mark of the beast. 666. You know, they all, they come up with all of this stuff. You know, they say chips underneath your skin or your cell phone or whatever, you know. No, the mark of the beast is something that's very specific. And these people are going to intentionally get it. And they're going to pay a very specific punishment for that, as he describes here, which is different than uh, other humans. God has a plan for Israel as a nation. Now, this does involve the salvation of humans, but there's also more involved. Romans chapter 11 and verse 1 is an example here. Romans chapter 11 and verse 1 says, I say then, has God cast away his people? May it never come to be, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. And this is, of course, Paul writing this. He says, no, God has not cast away Israel. He won't cast away Israel. Now drop down to verse 17, and he goes on to talk about this. And here he says, if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you boast, remember that you do not support the root. The root supports you. And in the context of what he's talking about is, yes, for a time Israel's been cut off from that benefit, but they're going to be regrafted back in. Because you were grafted in, not being natural of that tree, not being a, a natural Jew, but you're getting the benefits thereof. Don't boast against God's people because he has a plan for Israel. Of course, God right now is dealing with the Gentiles. And of course, you see that here as he's talking about the, uh, what he's referring to here in the context of Romans chapter 11. Is he's dealing with the Gentiles right now. So for now... Israel's not getting the benefits, but Israel will be returned to that position because God has a plan for Israel. God has vessels that are made for wrath. Romans chapter 9 and verse 22. Now these vessels, if you want to get more specific, these are people that he's talking about in the context. What if God, wanting to show his wrath, um, this word wrath would be the outward manifestation of his anger, and make his inherent ability known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And he said he's talking about humans who actually, their intent is for God to pour his wrath out upon them. God showed this. He's done this a couple of times. And one of the good examples of this is Pharaoh. 
and talking about Pharaoh when the Pharaoh specifically, where he was uh, refused to release uh, Israel. God poured out his wrath. And then when Pharaoh was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. What did God do? It's like, no, I'm not done with you yet. He hardened his heart. Why? Because God used him to show the whole world there is no other God like him. So it's not just about salvation. There's more involved in God's plan. The dispensations deal with humans. The ages deal with intelligent beings. That means that there's more things going on than just things that relate to humans. There are more ages. There were ages prior to the dispensations. There will be ages of the ages after the dispensations. There are only seven dispensations. That's, that's it. That's the end of the dispensations. Now, the dispensations are designed specifically right now to show mankind something about himself. Okay. But ages are actually show, are, are designed to show intelligent beings something about God. That's more than just humans. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse uh, 10 talks about the dispensations. Uh, the fact that when you actually look through Scripture... Um, you can find that there is specifically seven dispensations. There are very good rules, and we've gone over that, especially in the class on dispensations. There are very good, solid rules that, that Scripture lays out on determining what a dispensation is. You have to have a steward. You have to have a household. You have a specific rule that God has laid on those people, whether it's the entire human race or only a portion of the race. Example of this with, with Adam and Eve was the entire human race. Yeah, there was only two of them, but what about the next dispensation? It was the entire human race. But after the flood, well, more specifically, I should say, after the Tower of Babel, because even after the flood, God was dealing with the whole human race, he picked out one person, and now Israel was given specific instructions where the others were not. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10 says that the dispensation of the fullness of times might, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth in him. He's going to, the last dispensation we have is the dispensation of the fullness of times. It's also referred to as the millennial kingdom. That's the next dispensation. And it could, it could literally start tonight to some degree. Well, okay, that's a little bit of a hyperbole because we still have to have the tribulation period. We still have some things that have to happen, but it could be approximately seven and a half years from tonight. Let's put it that way. If God chooses to come today because the, dispens uh, the tribulation period is still seven years. In verse three, or chapter three in verse nine, still in Ephesians, he talks about the hidden dispensation, which would be our dispensation. In Ephesians chapter three and verse nine, it says, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which was from the beginning of the ages, has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Wow, that's really hard to interpret and understand because that word fellowship there is actually your word dispensation. There's no textual issue here. It's a translation issue. It's not to see what is the fellowship of the mystery. It's to see what is the dispensation of the mystery. That mystery that he had actually kept hidden. That would be our dispensation today. When it comes to ages... We don't actually have a number of ages. I do know from Scripture that there are currently 11 ages revealed. But Scripture goes on to say there's going to be ages of the ages. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse uh, 7 is an example of this. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now, this is one example of what's going to happen with the church in the future. 
we are always going to be in a place of grace. And it's going to be multiple dis, uh, ages after this. Uh, 1 Timothy is also another example of this. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be high-minded nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. See, it says, command those who are rich in this present age, indicating that there were previous ages and there will be ages to come. Now, there's other scriptures that talk about ages of the ages. There's a lot of scripture that talk about that. So there's more in God's plan involved than just salvation. We have the new heavens and the new earth over in Revelation. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1 is where it begins to talk about this. And it says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Does he actually say a new heaven or a new... Um, he does actually say uh, a new heaven. That is interesting to me because right now he refers to them as the heavens, plural. Yet here we have, he says, I see a new heaven singular heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away and also there is uh, here he says there's no more sea and this is what he's actually um, God is giving him a vision of this there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth which means there's going to be something actually when you when you really study this out we know that there, it is a time period in which there will be no dispensations because there's not going to be rules upon mankind because all of those who are in this new heavens and new earth actually are righteous. Righteousness settles down and, and feels at ease. It doesn't rule, it feels at ease, which means righteousness is the norm. Actually, it's more than that, isn't it? Because if you're feeling at ease, righteousness is all there is there's going to be no sin at that point period so god's plan and what he's doing today involves a lot more than just a focus on salvation now we're looking at salvation but we don't want to get so um we don't want to get tunnel vision and not pay attention to the other things that god is doing also you know god is also showing uh not only humans but also intel, uh, angels or spirit beings more specifically, because there's more than just angels, uh, things about himself. Now I'm going back and looking at a focus on the roles of the person in, in the roles of the persons of the Godhead in salvation. I want to examine that because each of them actually have an involvement in how we were actually saved. All three persons played a very specific role, actually, in providing eternal salvation for the grace believer. Now, we're focusing on the salvation that we have today. Now, there are other saints. There were other saints in other dispensations. There will be more saints in the dispensations to come. They're not of the church. I'm kind of focusing on the church right now, on salvation in that context. So when I'm talking about eternal salvation for the grace believer, um, I'm taking the concept of salvation and I'm kind of honing it down specifically to us of this particular dispensation. God the Father is the source. Uh, James gives us an example of that where it talks about uh, James chapter 1 and verse 17 where it talks about everything that is good and everything that is mature comes from above. And comes down from the Father of lights, whom there is no variance or shadow of turning. Of his own will, and this is his own determinate will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. That is actually what he has chosen for us as a church to be a first fruit of his creations. <clears throat> 
So he's not just talking about humans there. So God is actually, God the Father, he's the source of this. He's the one who determined to do this. It's his determinate will. He's the one who sent the Son. You know, if the Father didn't send the Son, we wouldn't have a Savior. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14. Now, on the same side of that, if the Son didn't come, we wouldn't have a Savior. So you see both of them actually involved in that. But here in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, And we have seen the testimony that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. They've seen it. And he goes on to say, whoever um, confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, that word confess there is, says, says the same thing. So there's an agreement in that, that Jesus is the Son of God. God abides in him and he is, uh, abides in God. John chapter 3 and verse 16 talks about the fact that God the Father sent the Son. John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, or more specifically, his one-of-a-kind unique Son, that whosoever, or uh, again, more specifically, in order that the one believing in him should not perish, but have not everlasting life, should have eternal life. Now, this is your word for eternal, not everlasting Oh, there is a distinction in Scripture. All humans have everlasting life. Only the saved ones get eternal life. God the Son is involved in our salvation. Over in uh, Titus, chapter 3 and verse, starting in verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared... Not by works of righteousness, which he has done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now, here in this context, and you keep on going down, um, who he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It's through Jesus Christ that we get this salvation. Now, there's more, of course, involved in here because we also see the Holy Spirit. We actually all see all three persons of the Godhead here. And all three of them are involved with it. He is the Savior of the world. Back over in the first John. First John chapter 4 and verse 14 says, And he and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. It's pretty clear there. The Holy Spirit performs the work of regeneration, which we were just looking at that in Titus chapter 3 and verse 1. And we're going to, by the way, I'm, I'm brushing over some of this at the moment. I'm looking at it at a little bit higher level because we're going to get into detail. What does it mean that the, by the Holy Spirit washed and regenerated us? In salvation, we're going to look at that into more detail. So he performed the work of regeneration. He applies the work of Christ in salvation. Uh, John is uh, where we get an example of the work of, Christ, of the Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 16 and starting in verse 7. John chapter 16 and verse 7. Here uh, Christ is talking to the disciples. This is before his death, but he's talking about what's about to come. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper or comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. So there's an involvement of conviction of sin, of righteousness and judgment. He is the one who convinces us that we need to believe in Christ because that's the single sin that he's dealing with. All the other sins don't matter in comparison to that one because if you don't take God at his word that you have to be saved through believing in his son, there is no salvation in any other way. The focus in salvation is on the second person of the Godhead. Amen. Uh, he's the one, of course, who came. 
over in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, it talks about the fact that he is our Savior. Luke 2, 11 says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, Messiah the Lord. He is the captain of our salvation, the author of our salvation. He's called for um, his, we're called for his purpose and grace, which he is, uh, which God the Father has given to us in Christ. And there is no salvation by any other name offered. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Now, next week, God willing, we're going to start to look at the earthly ministry of Christ and how it relates to salvation today.